Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode 295 of the Dudes and Beer podcast. Chris Jordan, your host here. Please do not forget, everybody, the Dudes and Beer podcast is now officially brought to you by PodcastCadet.com. If you're a fan of podcasting like me, want to start up a podcast for your friends, family, church, school, fun, business, whatever, stop on by PodcastCadet.com today. Podcasting is all we do over there. Everything from one-on-one workshops, training, uh, podcast consultations, audits, if you've already got a show up and running and just trying to hit the next hump, trying to hit that next goal of audience size, things like that, that's what we are there for. One-on-one professional consultation with people in the industry, everyone from AV folks like me to people that are in marketing, people that are in branding, uh, people that can help you be a better host through extemporaneous speaking All kinds of fun things. Podcastcadet.com is the website. Dudes20 is the code that you want to use to save 20% off your entire cart. Our guest tonight, the amazing Stephen Myers, the author of the books, Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid, as well as the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. He has a couple of... uh, Great documentaries that we will be talking about as well. All of these are available on the Dudes and Beer store. Welcome to the show this evening, Stephen Myers. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you, Chris, for having me on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening to come on. I know I have followed your work with Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid for a little while. And just recently, of course, uh, once we talked to each other, Decided to have you on the show, ordered my copies of the books, added all these to the Dudes and Beer store because they are some great information. And yeah, folks, you know, what we're going to be talking about this evening is a theory, and it's a working theory. Uh, As we have heard from great people like 34-year professor of history Richard B. Spence, uh, history is not a science. It is not complete. It is not whole. It, to think it is, is naivete. And to think that something like the history of Egypt or Egyptology is complete and whole is once again naivete. Uh, so to have a theory like what Stephen is proposing this evening in the lost technologies of the Great Pyramid and how the Great Pyramid was built and what its purpose may well have been I think is very apropos and very necessary. So uh, welcome to the show, Stephen. I can't, I cannot wait to start getting into this and start talking a little bit about uh, what really went into the building of the pyramids, because your theory that you hold is incredible. It's fantastic. And something that I have never heard before. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. People that, take the time to find out about it usually uh use the word compelling yeah and that it makes sense so so thank you very much for that well let's definitely i'm going to go ahead and bring up on screen real quick while we talk um a, a little bit at the what is the video for your first book kind of the the video trailer and as we discuss a little bit about the system used to build the pyramid uh i think this is a really great thing to kind of have looped in the background while we discuss that let's start getting in because of course the traditional uh consideration is that things were built with a huge looped ramp around things um all that kind of stuff and your theory takes a totally different route from the traditional i mean there's even the the theory that the large channel off to the side near the sphinx was used to saw the bricks with huge saws all kinds of things um so let's start getting in a little bit to the water locks used 
uh, that you discuss in your documentary and in the book, Stephen? Yes, we think that uh, Egyptologists are wrong in how they contend the Great Pyramid was assembled. They think that there were workers with the big back muscles and the big ramp that probably may have been bigger than the Great Pyramid itself. And Egyptology doesn't demonstrate any of that at all. So, uh, And they also say that the precision stone cutting was accomplished using hand tools, but they've never made a single casing stone like those of the Great Pyramid. Yeah. But uh, I contend that the Great Pyramid was built by geniuses and that they used water locks uh, like those of the Erie Canal or the Panama Canal, just sure. water locks from the Nile River up to the building site and were able to move and lift the uh, stones uh, all the way up from the Nile up to the building site, and they did it effortlessly. didn't need big back muscles at all. Uh, so uh, they moved the first stones that they moved were the first layer of casing stones, and they brought them up and set those in place and those stones are cemented together watertight yeah. with a strong bonding agent. They added more water into that square enclosure, the first layer of casing stones, and uh, filled that with water. And they were able to move the stones from the dial all the way up to that pond, move the stones from barges uh off the barge and into the pond, and when that pond was filled with stones, the first layer was completed. So it uh, was a systematic and production line process that was quite fast, much faster than Egyptologists because they have yet to move a stone that weighs even 16 tons. Yeah. The entire science has never moved one of those stones. Size stones, even one inch. Mm -hmm. So it was an efficient process, working level by level, all the way up to the capstone. And it, it, even going through and watching this, like I said, as you describe it, makes so entirely much sense. Uh, we know that they had a great understanding of lock systems, uh, that kind of stuff from Alexandria. Uh, the lighthouse yes. itself floated out on a surface similar to that. So um, it, for for that to have existed or been there is not anything strange whatsoever, you know. Um, and you know, yes. So for, for me, it, once I started reading this and seeing what you were talking about, uh, it's been held by Egyptologists for years and years that, the the mar the stones and granite used to build the pyramid came from a quarry upriver in the Nile. Yes. So if they were to yeah flood the area, it would be super easy for them to be able to build something like this. You don't have to then drag stones across dirt uh, using logs and thousands of people and it, like yeah, it it really isn't any kind of alien technology necessary <laughs> uh, you true. know uh true you mentioned aliens people that say aliens built the great pyramid are also saying that um we uh, weren't capable weren't of doing it. To build it yeah yeah so, but i think i think the ancient builders of the great pyramid were geniuses and that they used this unique and systematic uh building method that I describe in my books and were able to complete the construction of this massive uh, construction project. Well, and what's great is the, the the evidence that you show in the book, number one, and the method that you demonstrate with the, the prelude to the book, the video that we were just watching a moment ago. And it, along with those comes the fact that, yeah, even to this date, there has not been uh, a study done to scale where an engineer was able to build a scale model of the Great Pyramid in a scale amount of time uh, using methods that they considered proper uh, or used by the people. So, like you said, there's yes, that's correct. it's never been replicated. 
Yeah, Egyptologists say, oh, working people and peasants can move stones and also uh, create extremely precise stone cutting. They could do all that all day long, but the entire science of Egyptology, those experts can't do it at all. So it's very yeah. puzzling for a science to abhor the scientific method. They can't demonstrate how it was done. What Egyptologists do is they'll move maybe a ton and a half stone and then say a foot or two and then say, well, that's how 70 ton payloads uh, were moved. But that's very disingenuous. It's very dishonest to do that. That's like me saying, I can lift a car. I can, I can pick up a car just with my hands and just lift it over my head. Yeah. But I, I do that with, I, I show how I can do that by lifting a Hot Wheels car. Do you see, do you see that? Yeah. It's not a very satisfying demonstration. Yeah, well, especially whenever you're lifting a one <laughs> one or two ton stone and some of the stones at the pyramid are in excess of 20 tons. Uh, yes. they're, they're just the largest are 70 tons. Yeah, about. exactly. Uh, and just so, massive uh, in size, something that even our most intense modern cranes would not be able to handle. Well, the Erie Canal, when built, was in the eight, 1830s, pre-Civil War. It was four and a half feet deep, but the barges handled 70-ton payloads. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> well, and the yeah, physics so, of water so goes funny. a long way. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's a method that can lift battleships, and we think that's how uh, the geniuses built the Great Pyramid without massive back muscles they didn't use elephants and they didn't have a magic wand if you will and uh, that type of thing so well and let's start getting into what brought you to this hypothesis what is it that brought you to this understanding of the construction of the pyramid and the complex there well um to put a long story short, my background is very technical. Uh, everything from electronics, amateur radio operator, FCC, commercial class radio television license, a whole bunch of degrees and certificates, that type of thing. So I like technology and happen to like history. I collect antique gasoline engines and a whole bunch of other stuff. So uh, the Great Pyramid is a technological wonder but it's from history, if you will. So I was interested in it. It's a 45-story skyscraper built in ancient times, the tallest building in the world for at least 4,000 years. So uh, it's interesting. And then I did, you know, I'm an older guy, so way back when I started, you'd go to the library and check out a book. So I read the books by Egyptologists that talk about the big ramp and the strong back muscles and the sweat and all of that. I, oh, okay. You know, they're experts and they have a story to tell. So all I needed to do was see their demonstrations. And I found out that Egyptology doesn't have any demonstrations that are legitimate. You know, they it's bizarre. So I read the alternative books, you know, that the Great Pyramid was a death ray or that it, that it was a beacon for aliens to find a way back home or whatever. But then I, I – uh, read a whole host of books, but I finally found this one book privately published by Edward Kunkel. And he wrote a book called Pharaoh's Pump, and it was right up my alley. It was mm. just, not, it wasn't about gods, it wasn't about aliens, or it wasn't about religion, or, or language, or uh, battles, or what the Pharaoh's hat was like, or any of that stuff, or mummies. It was about how the Great Pyramid was assembled. That book was Pharaoh's Pump, and uh, made such an impression on me that I ultimately founded a nonprofit foundation dedicated to further Edward Kunkel's research, who died in the 80s, and uh, named after his book, The Pharaoh's Pump Foundation. So uh, that's how I got into this thing. When you say Pharaoh's Pump, and whenever you start talking about uh, the Great Pyramid being used as a water pump. 
uh, and being used as a pump in that way. Let, let's kind of start cracking that nut for the audience just a little bit because there are, of course, numerous theories regarding the Great Pyramid. And what, for me, myself, just as an ed- educated stab, um, it definitely was not a burial chamber. There were, if it was a burial chamber, it was for somebody that they never wanted to enter the afterlife. Let's let's just put it that way, because according to all Egyptian tradition, there there was a cadre of spells from the Book of the Dead that you had to be ready to recite once once you got to the the next part of life and started that journey as a spirit. And without those spells on the wall for you to recite and things like mm-hmm. that, uh, you were a wandering spirit. You did not enter the afterlife. And that was that was the curse of curses to the Egyptian people to not enter the afterlife. So uh, there are zero carvings inside of the Great Pyramid, ladies and gentlemen. There, there are none in the sarcophagus chamber, uh, which there's a great picture actually of you in the sarcophagus chamber uh, (laughs) (laughs) that I loved but it's it's odd when you start going through and looking at everything that quote traditional Egyptology teaches about the subject of burial burial chambers Mm -hmm. uh, burial Mm -hmm. complexes and none of these things fit with the Great Pyramid or the Pyramid Complex at Giza. None of them. Well, that's correct. Uh, the uh, Great Pyramid has no formal writing inside it at all. So, uh, And the reason for that is it's a machine, and the machine doesn't need any formal writing. There's no f- real formal writing deep inside your car engine, maybe a few part numbers, but yeah. uh, it doesn't need writing. It's a machine. So uh, Egyptologists say, well, uh, it don't look like a tomb because there's all these different chambers and everything. So uh, uh, it is a tomb. They must have had cha- uh, several changes of plans during construction because uh, I guess they didn't really know what they were doing. So that's, that's what Egyptologists say because it, it, it presuppose it's a yeah. tomb. It doesn't look like a tomb. Oh, uh, they didn't know what they were doing. Here's another question. How do long open passages and doors on pivots and sliding stones protect a pharaoh's treasure and mummy? They don't. Yeah. But you'll never get a coherent answer from an Egyptologist on that. Well, and why is there no evidence of a, a of a mummy in the sarcophagus? Like there's there's no evidence oh. that the sarcophagus has ever been used to hold a corpse or a body or ushaptis, uh, which are the jars that hold the sacred mm-hmm. innards. Um, for those that don't e- know, it's Egyptology e- has an answer for everything. The reason why there's no mummy in there is because it was stolen in ancient times before modern Egyptologists could steal it. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, always you know the, the work of tomb raiders. A, uh, you know the difference between a tomb robber and an Egyptologist? A permit? An Egyptologist has a college education, Yeah, and a tomb robber don't. <laughs> At least not most of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's even funnier. Yeah. 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 So, uh... Well, yeah, I and, mean, uh, they they come up with stories. They lack uh, any demonstrative, uh, you know, validation in terms of demonstrations. Egyptologist stories. So yeah. there you are. Well, and, and it's a theory. Egyptology is actually in crisis because of their lack of demonstrating uh, what they say in terms of of demonstration. So well, sure and absolutely. Now there is something to be said whenever. Things are written in hieroglyph, that kind of stuff, because of course that's a that's a written record there, and we can we can translate hieroglyphs. We we have mm-hmm. things like codices and that kind of stuff that mm-hmm. that give us the vernacular mm-hmm. of what those sacred symbols mean. But 
when when it comes to Egyptology as a whole, it is definitely one of those that I I think fully participates in the religion of science, as we put it on this oh, show. Yes. Uh, where, where despite any new evidence, they are so reticent to change, because oh, yeah. any any change in that dialogue destroys any work done by those before. And yes, I've actually uh, made a YouTube video uh, asking the question: Is Egyptology a pseudoscience? Mm. And it's on my YouTube channel that you can get to from my website, thepump.org. dot yep. And it's uh, it's it's received a lot of interest, you know, because it describes Egyptology being intractable. It describes their hostility to any type of change or anything like that. How Egyptology yeah. doesn't work well with other disciplines and other characteristics of pseudoscience. So it's it's an interesting video. I hope people watch it. Yeah, it was definitely very interesting uh, to go and watch that. That was one of many that we added to the Dudes and Beer videos section today whenever we went and added your YouTube channel. So it, for, for me at least, uh, like I, I love the science of Egyptology. I love reading about Egypt. It has been one of those cultures that for me, much like the ancient Greeks when I was a kid, uh, mm -hmm. I, I just gravitated toward the 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 rich epic mm -hmm. stories of their gods of the the history passed down from gods to man things like that uh, always fascinated me and to know that now Egyptology is I mean it was always a fringe science because not that many people were able to study it so to speak. You know, it wasn't right. it wasn't like biochem, you know. Hey, there's there's probably twenty eight classes you could go take at your local college regarding biology or chemistry or the marriage of the two. Uh your chances of happening into a Egyptology course at your local college pretty nil at most places. It is. You know? It is. But but they still have uh departments of Egyptology that just repeat the same thing over and over for a hundred years, and the science yeah. isn't changing at all. Everyone is interested in in ancient Egypt and the distant antiquity of the Valley of the Nile, but I think Egyptology is the greatest hindrance to understanding ancient Egypt. Well, and explain that statement for us real quick. In, well, in what way? is intractable in their ideas that they've come up with a hundred years ago, like precision stone cutting was accomplished using hand tools, but that cannot be demonstrated by even stone masons or anybody. The same type of uh, precision stone cutting that yeah. is seen in ancient Egypt. For example, the casing stones that used to cover the Great Pyramid are cut with extreme precision, mm -hmm. but it can't be done using the method they say it was done. Yeah. So uh, that's that's an issue. And, and and there's a whole bunch of other things that they just declare edicts, and we're supposed to believe it. So there's there's a lot of problems with Egyptology. Sure. Uh, and sciences come and go. You know, uh, they, Egyptology is not a on a pedestal for me by any means. There was another science called phrenology about the bumps on people's heads yeah. and how that relates to character traits. Yeah. But that, that science that was taught in colleges couldn't withstand the rigors of the scientific method, and it went away. And, and the same thing is going to happen to Egyptology because they will not change. They would rather, um, you know, wither on the vine than uh, keep up with the times. Yeah, and that's a that's an interesting point to bring up. Just the the fact that they are unyielding and unwilling to grow and unwilling to explore new avenues and new thought forms. Um, like myself, I'm a I'm a big follower of physics and just the physics community, um, mm -hmm. and the the way that they are willing 
to explore physics just numbs my mind sometimes and and it's almost at points with almost a reckless disregard where it's like well yeah we have to collide these things and see what happens sure we may make a micro (laughs) black hole but how else are we gonna find out man you know like and that's Mm -hmm. kind that's kind of what i want is that damn that damn the torpedoes attitude with so many of these sciences uh, when it comes yeah. to Egyptology, when it comes to all of it, um, yeah, because that's really where the growth comes from. Yeah, that's why Egyptology hasn't grown. Uh, pick up a book written in 1900 that's about Egyptology, mm. and it says the same thing that they're saying now. Yeah, it, it, it's it's stagnated into a mystery religion, Egyptology, and their their professors are actually just uh, you know priests. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, but less and less people actually believe what they say. It's uh, a science in crisis right now. Well, and I think, granted that there are a lot of sciences in crisis right now, uh, <laughs> because there because there are a lot of people of open mind uh, and a lot of research coming about. You know, there's uh, even even today I saw. Uh, magnetic cloaking now now a possibility being able to cloak wow. things with just a magnetic field uh no longer having to use semiconductors things like that so amazing yeah yeah amazing leaps of technology and like you're saying for for the egyptologists to say that they made these with hand tools at the time of uh i'm trying to remember was it the copper age at the time of the Great Pyramid? Well, it's whatever age you want to say. Everyone has a different idea Mm. about its age. Yeah. So, uh, but but if they say how it was done, you would think they could accompany that with a demonstration, but they don't. Yeah. Uh, Not not to harp on Egyptologists, but uh, if there was a, a science that was the cow jump over the moon ology, you would kind of expect them to demonstrate a cow jumping over the moon. Yeah. But, they, you know, it, it's just strange that uh, that Egyptology is gets away with uh, the things that they do. But it's, it's uh, we're in a revolution of ideas right now in so many fields, including uh, how and why the Great Pyramid was assembled. Yeah. Well, let's get into that a little bit, uh, because, of course, there's the concept of the lock system, like we were talking about earlier, uh, which is a phenomenal concept to think about. And like we were saying, when you when you start to look at the the simple fact of they were already using the Nile to push these Mm -hmm. to push these great things down the river. Uh, these 60 yes. ton boulders and and rocks that they had carved up there and cut um so why why not just flood the plain and build it and well it makes sense to me That's yeah for darn sure now and our video series on our website describes the whole process in great detail so they can look at that now what was it when you were there that began to lead you down this road of flooding the Giza plain to add layers onto the pyramid as a, as a whole layer, like you're talking about. Well, that, uh, the, the, uh, construction process was already pretty much understood even before I, I went there, but, uh, yes, I've certainly been to Egypt. And we planned on going to Egypt in February, me leading a tour, but that uh, was canceled because of coronavirus. But, uh, yeah, the uh, Great Pyramid is, uh, if if anyone can, at least once in their life, go to Egypt to see those things. It's just mind-boggling. Even the, the scale of the components is is beyond human back muscles to to assemble in some orderly process and it's uh, massive and almost completely solid 45 stories tall so it's uh, 
it's a, it's a marvel to be sure. Yeah. Now, where along the plateau and up around the pyramid did did you first start coming to the realization of the possibility of flooding the area uh, to undertake this building in this way? Well, they, uh, when they originally built the Great Pyramid, there was an enclosure wall around the uh, construction site, and that is what they, they filled with water. And then they had canals from the Nile River all the way up to the building site. So they didn't really just flood everything, the whole yeah. Egypt, if you will. Oh, it sure, was just sure. uh, localized to, to the construction site. Yeah. But uh, that's, uh, you know, that's the purpose of that enclosure wall. That wall existed up until the 18th century. Oh, wow. That surrounded the Great Pyramid. Even uh, Napoleon's savants, when they drew oh, yeah. the Great Pyramid, included that wall. Yeah. Egyptologists say that's to keep the unwashed masses away from the... Uh, sacred great pyramid but it was uh, for, for uh the uh, construction per, uh, process which is again detailed in our video series yeah and uh, you know you can you can get all of these uh not only at their website you can get them on amazon you can get them on dudes and beer uh you even have a a second book the giza prosperity machine uh, the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. Uh, let's let's start getting into that just real quick. Uh, okay. Here in here in this second part, because I think it's important for people to realize not only how the pyramids were built, which it's a great theory to, you know, discuss the whole lock system and and barrier wall that was flooded, uh, but to get into the use of the Great Pyramid, because like we're saying, it, it isn't uh, used as traditionally thought where it was a, quote, I'm not going to say it wasn't a sacred site because even using it for this kind of purpose would have been scientific at the time and, quote, sacred. You know, that would have been like knowledge that the priests had uh, to do this kind of thing and to have this kind of... Uh, undertaking that would have definitely been knowledge that would have been seen as sacred amongst ancient cultures. Um, so, well, yes. Well, my uh, research is divided uh, easily or kind of nicely between how the Great Pyramid was assembled and why it was assembled. The Great Pyramid was a huge construction process that uh, cost a lot of resources. Uh, to build. So we think that uh, because of that, there was a bigger uh, return on investment than just uh, putting a pharaoh's carcass in one of the chambers, that the uh, there was a huge return on investment for the construction of the Great Pyramid, that it was its its cost, was a was actually a wise investment and what they did with the great pyramid is use it as a machine and that machine was infrastructure which provided prosperity for the civilization that built it and uh, it uh, transformed the desert into a garden and it transformed toil into leisure and it transformed poverty into prosperity and it did all of that by being built to be a water pump and in what way does the great pyramid work like a water pump we think that the chamber below the great pyramid was built before the great pyramid itself and that chamber acted like a similar to a hydraulic ram water pump, but much more sophisticated than that. And that pump supplied water to the water locks as the construction process uh, continued level by level. And when the con entire Great Pyramid was assembled, it was similar to two water pumps that were connected in series. So 
The path water took through the Great Pyramid was that it entered the upper end of the descending passage. And other people think that uh, water entered the upper end of the descending passage, including Christopher Dunn and, and other researchers. So water entered the upper end of the descending passage, went down to the subterranean chamber, and we think that the, the odd construction of that chamber facilitated a water vortex or implosion like Victor Schrauberger talked about. And uh, anyway, that ultimately caused water to move up to the lower end of the, of the Grand Gallery. And they were able to use electrolysis in that chamber. And other people think electrolysis was involved in uh, – the use of the Great Pyramid, including Christopher Gunn and other people. But electrolysis uh, caused oxygen and hydrogen to be separated from the water. Well, those two gases combined are quite volatile. They ignited those gases, which ultimately caused a vacuum to lift water in the Grand Gallery. So it ultimately lifted about a 300-ton water piston and they they were able to release the vacuum above that, and that water piston came down and moved water ultimately into the queen's chamber, which is was half full of air and half full of water. And then ultimately, uh, water moved from the queen's chamber to the king's chamber, and then ultimately out the king's chamber vents. So that's the, the path and a very short description of how the Great Pyramid water pump operated. So al and almost so, in a in a uh, in like a ramjet engine concept, where it's a self sustaining explosion. That, kind of that once you start kind that like combustion, that, yeah. it's going to keep going and keep creating a sm every time it goes whoop and and sucks in air. It's going to suck water up with it every time. Uh, which would it, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. And it had uh, a timing mechanism for the valves and other things that are um, supported by evidence inside the uh, Great Pyramid. It's actually quite technical, not as technical as a V8 engine by any well, means. Well, uh, no, no. But, but uh, it's, it, yeah, but people can read about uh, that in my second book and also in my second documentary and see – how water moved and how how yeah. it actually worked. So well, uh, and it, you know that that really lends a lot of credence to a lot of things because if you start going through and looking at pictures of the king's chamber, things like that, there there's evidence of what looks like scorch marks or explosions. Oh, that's true. There, uh, especially in the king's chamber, yeah. it looks like that that chamber was expanded. And yeah. many people say that there was some sort of an explosion. We think that uh, there was a malfunction in that chamber, and the air cushion uh, ultimately was absorbed into the water. And then the, if if I can say this, it was that chamber was hydraulic. The the hydraulic water pressure caused it to expand a little bit. So. Yeah. Uh, when it when it malfunctioned and all all that's in the book you know you can't describe everything in an hour show you can't you can't it, you really can't uh <laughs> even in a two-hour show i mean it's hard to do it in a one hour long documentary to begin with mm -hmm. but just to just to explain these concepts to some of our audience because uh our, our audience is fairly familiar at least most of them that listen with mm -hmm. the concept of ramjet engines and how they work we've we've discussed this with other guests uh when discussing different technologies that exist right now out there uh for different purposes and applications so mm -hmm. uh to know that that a, a ramjet engine can be made in your garage with zero moving parts uh, and to know that mm -hmm. the Great Pyramid had baffles and doors that moved, things like that, then yes, you could absolutely control airflow and choke. And and how that ramjet engine would be firing and pulling water and how fast and how much. Uh, it, like my brain just starts racing with all the possibilities <laughs> when considering well, using it, something it, like that mm -hmm. as a siphon to pull water. Well, it's a fascinating process to be sure, 
and uh, they went to all that effort to ultimately have uh, pumped water and uh, many uh, high, the largest structure in uh, North America is the Grand Coulee Dam up, up in Washington mm. State on the Columbia River and uh, it does generate a lot of electricity but it's yeah. also a self-contained self-powered water pump it irrigates over a million acres yeah. in central and eastern Washington so uh it's a great big water pump. Well, isn't and, that interesting? And that's just it to to know that that kind of technology exists and is being used right now. We are typically standing on the shoulders of geniuses. There's very little technology out there that we have not usurped from somewhere or repurposed from something else. Oh, that's true. Uh, a lot of a lot of ancient technology that we're using. Uh, in a whole host of fields, but uh, in Egypt, the Valley of the Nile has always needed and used water pumps. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, well, they have the Nile River, but the the water in the river is useless for irrigation. You got to get it up yeah. onto the land. Yeah. And also, the largest water pump in the world is in the Valley of the Nile. It's the Mubarak pumping station. People can look that up. So when you tell people, well, the largest water pump in the world that currently is uh, in Egypt, they just look at you funny because you'd be surprised how technically illiterate a lot of people are. They just think, oh, it's sacred or uh, special or something like that. But uh, it's a 45-story skyscraper that was uh, built in ancient times for a, a purpose that actually helped people. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's what it's all about. Well, and it, it it tends to make a lot of sense because when you go back and start reading history from that time, it it was not a desert right there. Uh, there, it talks about the lushness of the valley. It talks about the crops that were grown regularly. That kind of stuff. Yes. So, um, all yes. all of that being there really does hearken to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, whenever you go through and read it, and to know that this is a concept that modern Egyptology is kind of pushing away, shunning, not really paying attention to, uh, is. Uh, number one, par for the course uh, for a science such as <laughs> Egyptology. Uh, but number two, a little bit frightening, especially when you're talking about um, what what a rebirth of technology like this could do. Uh, because oh, yes. there are no moving parts. It's, it doesn't require moving parts to have sustainable water pressure. Well, it's uh, it's quite a quite a technology. We're a nonprofit foundation that it has a humanitarian side to it, and we want to redevelop this ancient technology for our modern but very troubled world. And it would be an alternative yeah. power source, if you will, that from hydroelectricity, uh, nuclear, coal, fossil fuel. So that's that's what we're doing. We're trying to redevelop this, and it's. Uh, it's uh, we've got some components, sub assemblies, and other experimentation at our facility uh, here in southwestern Oregon, and uh, so we're looking for a 3D printer if anyone has one or wants to purchase one for us, and also a plasma cutter, you know, for uh, that's they use it in welding and that type of thing. Yeah, for our fabrication. So keep those things in mind you know you can order it and just uh ship it to us and take it off your taxes so absolutely hopefully we can <laughs> well hopefully uh, we can get some help in that regard well seriously because this is a, to find somebody like you that is trying to rebirth this ancient technology this ancient concept for a modern use, for a modern repurposing, for being able to provide sustainable water and food for people that may may only have a scarcity of water, you know? Yes. 
it's yeah we think that it can be redeveloped uh, using uh cottage industries if you will uh backyard uh mechanics and you use uh, locally sourced materials. It doesn't have to be a stone pyramid or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, it can be uh, community built and that type of thing in third world countries uh, for one application. So uh, that's that's what we're trying to do. Uh, twice as many people die every day from from uh, lack of water. And uh, that type of thing then died at 9-11. So there's two 9-11s every day, and we just want to try to reduce that number. That's that's one of our goals yeah. for our foundation. Yeah, and that is a great, great goal. Uh, I mean, even, even here in America, we have that issue. When you start looking at areas like the Appalachian Mountains, uh, when you start looking at coal-rich areas, when you start looking at, you know, Heck, even areas like Flint, Michigan, uh, to be able to employ this kind of technology out there to create sustainable water um, is yes. just, it's fantastic. Yes. It's fantastic. And, and I know that. You, go you ahead. You can use the pumped water. Sorry to interrupt. You no, can no. use the pumped water as a uh, way to generate electricity. So it's uh, there's a whole host of, uh, uh, it's adaptable technology, a whole host of purposes. And, uh, you know, that's what I ended up dedicating my life uh, to pursuing this uh, information, these lost technologies, if you will, about the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. And, and that is just incredible to me, that there are people like you out there that are taking this ancient technology and ancient knowledge and these very simple concepts of physics... They are, they are not yes. complex concepts. They are not hard. Like, they are things that you can literally demonstrate with a McDonald's straw and water, <laughs> you know? Like, yes. ha- have you ever pipetted anything? It's almost the same concept with just a little bit more force behind it. Um, and it just so simple, so easy, and being able to apply it in so many different ways in a modern world. So... Once again, folks, yeah, there are people working on it. There are people doing it. People like Stephen Myers out there with uh, the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation. Yes, yeah, so uh, hopefully uh, that people can find out what we're all about. They can visit our website to see our uh, our uh, board of directors and our uh, mission statement and our activities and goals. And they can communicate with me via email is the best and, um, you know, ask a question, if you will, find out what we're about or even get involved. So uh, that's uh, that's why we have our website up there to be accessible uh, worldwide. How can people get involved? Well, they can get involved in a lot of ways. Uh, We accept prayer and uh, we love that uh, people. Uh, sharing a link to our website on their Facebook page. I mean, that's just a couple clicks. And, um, you know, you can uh, share share the podcast for this interview yeah. and say, hey, you know, here's something different than the same old thing, you know. Or they can uh, maybe read a book. Don't have to buy it. You, you can uh, go to the library. or uh, And if your own library doesn't have it, interlibrary loan it. Or Yep. Uh, find out what we're about or even get involved and uh, help. We have several uh, local people that are local that are uh, helping. We even have a welder, and that's much more valuable than an Egyptologist. Oh, yeah, it so, is. <laughs> that's so we, uh, we that's have functionally that. useful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> somebody that can actually do something. So isn't that fantastic? Not just date your but, antiquities, folks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or make up a story. Yeah, declare an eating. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so and then, but we have a we have a, a board of directors, pro bono legal counsel. We have uh, advisors and uh, co researchers. We have a uh, library here at our facility that uh, has a lot of published and unpublished materials, and uh, we have our research facility that we're equipping 
That's why I mentioned the uh, plasma cutter and the 3D mm. printer. Yeah. And uh, that type of thing. They could even, a uh, uh, company could donate it, and we can put a link on our website. We've done that to a few uh, sponsors sure. that we have. And that type of thing. So, uh, you know, people can, uh, you know, just spread the word. So uh, you can help in a lot of ways. And that's what I love about you guys is that you have made everything so accessible. Just going through your website right here on screen as you were describing things. Everything is so well laid out. Everything is so absolutely available. Like even even the video series is it's a big file, but it's like, download the DVD file. Like, make your own DVD of it. You don't even want to make yeah. money off of that necessarily. You are just you just want people to have the information. Right. We do actually do that. We have the uh, ISO file of our uh, DVD that yeah. people, and people have, and they've uh, sure. handed out a few to people and uh, spread the word. We have a number of people that are that are helping that, that way, and uh, and again, even some sort of a sponsorship with tooling or materials yep. uh, for our construction project, and uh, even uh, you know, uh, if nothing, if everything else fails, even money. So uh, we, yeah. so it's uh, we take PayPal or we have our address. But they could mail, mail us a card or a letter or materials. They can donate books to our library. If there's authors listening, they could donate a book, and our our uh, circle of people can would read your book, type of thing. So uh, you know, spread the word and spread ideas and that type of thing. So that's exactly that's what it's all about. You know, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. No, by any means. No, you are you, you know, aren't so, out there selling scale models of the pyramid for your backyard to pump water. That's that's not what uh, you're doing. Um, yeah, no, but, we're not doing that. Or but there's or an idea for any you. Any type of hokum or but, but there's uh, magic an idea. There's an idea for crystals. you though. You could you could good idea. <laughs> you could make a scale yeah. model <laughs> water pump. That'd be cool. Uh, but. Oh, that's- yeah, that's that's what we're doing. The scale has to be fairly large for us because of scalability <laughs> issues. That's right. No, you're laughing, but that's that's what we want to do. Yeah, is make us, uh, you know, if uh, make just a, a smaller one. Yeah, and it would well, something up smaller than forty. Elect- something smaller than forty, forty stories. Yeah, you know, even tw- even twenty feet is two stories. Sure, no, you're laughing. No, but you pump enough water that you can generate electricity, and you don't have to write a check for your electric bill. Yes, that's what we want to do. It would be beautiful so, to mean, be able to get it small it, enough to be able to fit in a backyard. Oh yeah, you wouldn't need a big footprint like a pyramid. They no, did that because of the method that they built it, and because it had to be hugely strong. They didn't, ha- you know, if it was ma- if they had steel plate steel, it would only need to be a quarter inch yeah. thick. The the walls, yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we think we want to use probably polypropylene and PVC pipe and some off the shelf components, but some custom fabrication and ultimately build it. But that's a uh, resource intensive. That is activity. that is a resource, and not just that, but it's uh, like. What most people don't realize when it comes to this kind of science uh, is it's not just got to be repeatable. It's it, it's got to be tested and tested and tested and mocked up and mocked up. And that's what takes time. That's what takes money is building it. And then mm-hmm. once you're done, making sure that you can build it again and that it works and prototyping and that kind of stuff. Right. It is it right. is so that's, intense. That's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, with uh, a, fair, a fairly large scale model type of mm. thing. Yeah. That guy Dyson that made vacuum cleaners, yeah. he made hundreds of prototypes, but uh you know, that's it's a little different. Yeah. You know, scale if you will. Yeah. So uh that's that's just the nature of uh, and, and it costs money. It 1903 does. Um, Einstein figured out the theory of relativity. Well, they tried to, ultimately, in the mid-40s, they developed a product using that theory. That product was the atom bomb. Yep. Okay? 
that's that's what they did. They did prototyping and built a product. And the the budget for that product, you know what the budget was? To build offhand, the atomic bomb. Offhand, I do not. I do. It was infinity. There was a shortage of copper. They needed some uh, copper tubing. So there was a shortage of copper. They said, oh, well, we'll just use silver. They made silver pipes, you know. That yeah. Silver. So there was, there was absolutely unlimited budget, and they were able to make it. So yeah. uh, I'm not asking for an unlimited budget, but uh, the, the amount of funding – uh, will would accelerate the uh, research. I'm just I'm just telling yeah. you. you know? No, no, it 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 exponentially accelerates the research. Uh, so mm-hmm. anything that people can do to go help to get behind projects like this, even going through and uh, following their following their stuff and sharing it, like you're saying, getting word mm-hmm. out there about it, trying to build your own working models. Yes. Things Go out like there that. And build your own. You there, know? Are, there actually are a few people out there worldwide that's doing similar ish um, type of research. You know, the profound link between mm. water and the Great Pyramid, and that it was a machine. So it's not just myself. It's a it's a new understanding of yeah of these ancient structures that they actually served a purpose and actually helped people instead of just being tombs. Or something like that. When yeah. John Kennedy was assassinated, he was a revered leader, and all our civilization did was bury him in a hole in the ground and have an, an eternal flame. We didn't build a fifty billion dollar pyramid to put his carcass in. Yeah, you know it would it would be nonsensical. And the mummies they did find in Egypt were buried in a hole in the ground in the Valley of the Kings, yeah. which is much different than uh, pyramids. Yeah, far different, far different. <laughs> so, and I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on to start demystifying. That's, that is what this show is all about. I love rabbit holes, folks, but there is nothing that I love more than when I get to help demystify a topic. And, hey, I love my ancient aliens. I'm not going to lie, Stephen. Um, I am a believer at heart. But like we were saying earlier, to say that is that it could only be that discounts the extreme possibility and extreme mm-hmm. talent of mankind. We we are an I, in, I agree with you. we are an That's ingenious true. species, my friend. Uh, even when stranded on a desert island, the professor could make a radio out of coconuts. That's right. Because yeah, we've seen it on TV. Because <laughs> he had he had the willpower to do it. Um, yes. But but, to, but the, to, great, the great pyramid is a structure that's entombed yeah. in misunderstanding. Exactly. And one of the goals in my life is to peel away as much of that as I can. So that's the, one of the goals of my life and our foundation. Well, I think that you were doing a fantastic job of it, Stephen, not just in your life, but with the foundation and with books like Lost Technologies of the Great Pyramid, as well as the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine. Uh, these, these lay out such a common sense case for the building of these monuments and for their actual use and for the reason why they are constructed in the way that they are constructed. Well, thank you. That's uh, very, very heartwarming when you say that. Well, I mean, I, like I said, not that I don't love the other theories, not that I don't lo- I'll dig rabbit holes all day, you know, uh, <laughs> but when when it comes to something like this, I would much rather have a common sense explanation for it. And there typically is a common sense explanation for it. You know? There is. There is. Mm-hmm. So to to know that you were out there with this, to know that you were out there with the pump dot org, uh the amazing oh. website for the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation, uh trying to get this knowledge out there, trying to let people know more about it. I think is fantastic. I want you to know that our airwaves are always your airwaves. 
you're more than welcome to come on anytime, talk about this stuff. Uh, we have been trying to get people on for the longest time to intelligently talk about these topics. I mean, I could have somebody on that maybe knows a little bit or took a class or two at some point and just have a conversation like a lot of shows. I prefer bringing people on that have written books about them, uh, that have their own theories, that are out there in the field working at doing this work uh, because it makes for real conversation. It makes it makes for uh, the opportunity to open your mind to a different paradigm in reality. And I think that this is one that not too many people have been hipped to, to use the vernacular of certain generations. Um, right. It's it's a new understanding to many people. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people uh, say that, again, that it's compelling. It is. It is. It's very compelling. And I think it's it's something that has a lot of credence to it and deserves a lot more exploration. Thank you very much. So uh, please do hold the line while we close things out real quick for our audience. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, while you are online, everybody, checking out the great work of Stephen Myers, the amazing book, Lost Technologies is Great Pyramid, as well as the Great Pyramid Prosperity Machine, make sure to stop on by his website, thepump.org, where you can find out everything about the Pharaoh's Pump Foundation. While you are online there, make sure to stop on by dudesandbeer.com. That is where you can find everything, including our amazing episode that got banned in nine countries uh, here recently with Archbishop James Cloud. Uh, congrats, James. You have joined the Dudes and Beer Band Club. You have officially been on an episode that's been banned in nine countries. Uh, that's what happens when you talk in time prophecies, folks. Um, so until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, um, especially right now as things transition and change in our country. Be there for each other. Listen to each other. And remember, everybody, if you can't be good, be good at it. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.